Okay. There you go. There we go. Looking good, buddy. All right. Thank you. Like I was saying, thank you so much for attending Mogul Masterminds. Uh, it's always great to get a group of individuals together. I know that uh, with a long weekend coming up, um, weather being nice, that it uh, can be challenging to sit in front of your computer to just take everything in. So um, I'm going to start off um, just by introducing myself. So, you know, Devin kind of mentioned a little bit about me. Uh, so I've been an investor since 2014. Um, I'm about 50 doors on the residential and commercial side, Edmonton Realtor. Uh, I'm a partner here at Mogul as well with, with James Canal and uh, taking on the Edmonton team lead. So um, a little bit about my journey. We'll just kind of jump in that quickly. But uh, I joined through the old Key Spire routes. And for people who uh, have heard of that before, it was back before it was called Key Spire when it was called Lifetime Wealth Academy. So it was uh, quite a while ago, but it gave me the confidence to jump into to, uh, what I was doing. And uh, I ended up moving into the rain room and uh, meeting James Canal and seeing his, his uh, massive resume on, on the screen at uh, you know the young ripe age of uh, 32, 33. And I said, hey, if that guy that young can get to that many doors, he's got to be doing something right. So I uh, wanted to, to get mentored by that gentleman and uh, led me to getting my real estate license and then pushing over into just soaking up everything like a sponge. So um, big shout out, big gratitude to James for uh, putting me under your wing and teaching the ways. And, you know, our team, the mogul has, has expanded and we have uh, about 10 agents in Edmonton and uh, about six, seven agents in Vancouver as well. So um, big, big, big team that we got going on in, in both cities. So we're loving to push on some information to you guys and help um, educate you guys as well. So you can jump into multifamily, into residential, into investing uh, with the confidence as well. A little bit more about myself. So some exciting news for people who may or may not know, but uh, my wife and I, we have, uh, we're working on uh, making a baby. So that happened and uh, COVID was good to us. And so now Rebecca is uh, 20 weeks pregnant. Uh, so we just passed the halfway mark and we did find out it was a boy. So now the debate goes on how do you name a child? So if you guys have any good names, please don't use your own. But if you have any good solid options, please throw it in the chat and I'll definitely review, take a look. And uh, who knows, maybe you helped name our kids. So that'd be pretty cool. Um, another thing that uh, I'm about as well, a big, big car guy, big, uh, big into vehicles. And uh, you can see here, this is a, a Ford, 1978 Ford Bronco. I found that in doing a real estate transaction actually Big hit for that 45 to 75 year old male demographic. So I get a lot of waves while driving through. And uh, this is Walker the dog. He's, he's uh, one of our uh, amazing labs that we, that Rebecca and I have. And then we have our old 1977 Bonaire. So that has been traveling around with us for, for the last little bit in, uh, during these COVID times. So that's uh, just a little bit about me. So if you have any questions or you ever see a classic car that looks cool and needs a little bit of work, let me know. I love to always work on those projects. So what is multifamily? So a lot of this conversation, we're going to talk about, um, you know, how do we dive into it? I absolutely love, you know, speaking right after Keaton and James because they did a ton of the groundwork for me to explain some of, the, some of the intricacies, some of the challenges that we might face on the financing side. And that's probably gonna be one of the biggest topics when we talk about multifamily moving from residential to commercial. But first we need to know how do we, how do we, um, how do we define multifamily? What do we look for when we're talking about multifamily? So multifamily, the way that Lenders, CMHC, um, the Edmonton Real Estate Board, RECA, 
they basically define multifamily as anything as five units and greater. So on our left-hand side here, this looks to be just a, about a six-plex walk-up apartment building. Could even be a nine, just depending on how big it is. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that is, you know, a townhouse site. So both of these are classified as multifamily buildings. You can get commercial financing with them. And another big question we always get is, do they need to be uh, titled under one? Can they be individually titled? So a lot of times as an investment strategy, what people will do is they'll try to find properties that are condo titled. And for those Vancouver people is what they call strata titled. And so then you have a little bit of a uh, interesting exit strategy where you can sell off individual units um, and be able to sell off or pay off some of the investors that you may have. So this is just a general overview. So anything five units and more is what we classify as multifamily, and then one to four units is what we classify as residential. So why do investors make the jump? Well, Keaton kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, we didn't dive too much into it, but basically, if you're an investor and you're looking to get into financing, one of the biggest hurdles you have is the number of doors. So a lot of people will talk about hitting that, hitting that cap, hitting, hitting the wall at about four to six doors. And the problem is that they might not look at it at how large those mortgages are, but they'll look at it as how many mortgages you have. So sometimes people want to buy three or four condos, but that'll still eat up that door count. So Keaton and I just had a client that was, you know, looking at buying a couple of these properties. And so we're like, well, why don't you, why don't you get a couple, say maybe four plexes or even duplexes or suited homes instead of condos. So you don't have to eat up as much as your door count and you can get things that are cash flowing a little bit more. So the biggest thing is just hitting that door count. And once you get there, you might be flush with cap with cash, but most mortgages and most lenders are going to say, no, you're, you're capped. And the reason that they cap you is what we call the DCR, the debt coverage ratio. And with residential, typically they only take 50% of your rental income and use that to help you get approved. But most of it goes on to you personally. And that's why when an investor is building up their portfolio, they tend to work on the residential, they cap that out, and then they move into the commercial side. So we're going to dive into that a little bit more. All right, so differences between residential and commercial. So we're gonna take a look at this from a couple different angles. There's a lot of moving parts here. So if I miss anything or there's any questions that come up, please let me know. Please throw it in the chat. We can always book another call after. We're gonna have, I'm sure, a lot of conversations and a lot of points on some of this. So again, message mogul at, uh, or marketing at mogul RG. She'll pass on any of the questions that you do have and we'll definitely get back to you and book a call to go over these. But so timeline. So when we look at a residential contract, we typically have two sources of conditions. We have our financing and we have our inspection. Typically on a residential contract, you're gonna be given seven to 10 business days. Seven's pretty eager. Most mortgage brokers, if they're not too busy and lendors can get that done in that seven, seven day time frame. 10 days is, is kind of getting closer to the end of what most sellers will allow. And then from there, you're going to be looking at, you know, anywhere from a 15 to 30, 60 or 90 day close. That's giving you enough time to make sure you get your financing in order, you get your bank appraisal, you get your property inspection, remove conditions, and move on. Commercial, now this is where it gets a little interesting. So when we started talking about, um, you know, Keaton mentioned, James, let's jump into the conversation about due diligence. What are we going to be talking about? And so with commercial, we have a couple ways of looking at how do we approach a commercial, a commercial property and how are we going to analyze that? 
So when we look at the due diligence, we have our financing condition and we have our due diligence. Typically, most sellers are going to give anywhere from 30, 60, maybe 90 days. But when we're talking about commercial financing, you're, you can get it done in that 30 to 60 day time frame period. However, if you're going for a CMHC insured mortgage, now you're going to be looking at a three to four month time period. So in order to get that type of financing, you need to be creative in the way that you set up the deal. You're going to have to get creative with the seller. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts in order to get that locked down. People start talking about um, non-refundable deposits and things like that. We're going to start talking about some of the due diligence costs and what it, what it looks like. But to give you a high level of the way in order to protect our buyers from making sure that they don't just start spending money on random due diligence without making sure we um, understand that the building is operating as what it was advertised in the pro forma, we have a couple ways of balancing out our due diligence. So step one is what we call our, our phase one of due diligence. And that's essentially anything that we're going to do that's not gonna cost you the buyer money. So when we see a pro forma, you're gonna see a couple words on there. And it's our job to break it down and to say, okay, does this pro forma look legitimate? Does, is there definitely some salesmanship here? And some of those key words that you're going to be looking for is actual, estimated, stabilized. Some of those words are gonna be interchanged between different pro formas. Obviously for most people, you wanna see that in the pro formas, all the numbers are actuals. However, when you look and you see utilities as a, as a you know, even number, $6,000, 100% that's either an adjusted, stabilized or estimated amount. So being able to dive through the phase one and understanding, okay, are these numbers what the pro forma gave us true and accurate in the sense of what is actually happening with the building? So again, phase one is everything that we can do without paying a cent for due diligence. Once we figure out that financing is looking good and everything is worked out, we can move into phase two. Uh, there's kind of a break point once we go through the financing, because let's say that you know you're looking at a at a at a building and it's estimated to be at this purchase price, and now you go through it and they're estimating it to be a five cap, and you're that's what the pro forma says. You go through, you analyze the property, you go through all the financial documents, and you're like, huh. Something's not adding up. This is not performing as expected. We can get through that break point of the phase one and say, okay, Mr. Seller, since the pro forma wasn't accurate, we gave you an offer based on the pro forma. We're going to either renegotiate at this point so we can move forward into phase two of due diligence. We're going we're gonna to cancel and send our waiver in and, or a non-waiver and, and move on from the deal or everything looks good, let's move on with the next phase of due diligence. Phase two is anything that's gonna cost us money. So I'm gonna get into that a little bit further as far as what to look for and what are the steps in phase two. So next, let's talk about deposits. So in a, in a, residential, um, in a residential transaction, typically we're gonna be looking at a five, 10, maybe a $15,000 deposit, all depending on the purchase price of that property. Typically, most times you're gonna be putting one, uh, one deposit forward, which is, th sorry, three business days after final signing. On the commercial side, you're gonna be looking at usually minimum of $15,000, and then I've seen upwards of $75,000 for a deposit. There's going to be two sets of deposits, a little bit different than residential, but it's going to be the first one, typically about three business days after final signing. And then the next additional deposit is due after conditions get removed. 
So sometimes people want to keep the deposits the same. Sometimes they don't mind a, a smaller, like a 15 or $25,000 deposit. And then once they remove conditions, you know, that's when all the marbles are off the table and that's where you put up a little bit of bigger money. And that's, you know, can be a 50 to $75,000 deposit. Again, all depends on seller and the, and the price of that property. So due diligence and inspections. So this is where it gets a little bit fun. So this is when we move into phase two of the due diligence. So first one, building condition assessment. So when you're in residential, you typically get a property inspection. This property inspection is gonna cost you in the range of 500, maybe $1,000, depending on if it's a side-by-side -side duplex. Um, so it ranges you know, between that five and $1,000 range. Inspections are pretty thorough. They're going through appliances, they're going, they're going on the roof, they're checking the attic, they're testing the furnace, they're looking at the hot water tank, they're do, doing thermal imaging. They're basically looking at every aspect of the house. In a building condition assessment, usually it's a pretty, pretty generic walkthrough of the property. They're gonna maybe take a look at a couple suites. They're gonna be looking at balconies, just looking at the structure. They're not gonna really, they're not gonna test any appliances. They're not going to be looking at, um, you know, outlets and making sure that everything looks good. They're not gonna be opening up the electrical panels, but they're gonna give you a general assessment and they're gonna give you what is the life expectancy of some of the big components of the property. So we're gonna talk about roof, we're gonna talk about windows, we're gonna talk about boiler. So they're just gonna give you a general assessment of that. There's different companies, and this is where we always you know, push towards or, or guide towards our power team, because we want a combination of both. And depending on the type of investor you are, most investors wanna know, hey, give me the details. Tell me everything that's going on with this property. And so what typically happens is, we can still do a building condition assessment with also adding in an inspection. And that's just gonna be a more thorough look through and very similar to the residential where they're gonna be testing the appliances. They're gonna be opening up the electrical panels. They're gonna be going through all of the, the nuances and the small items that you would typically get done in a residential property, but they're gonna do it on a bigger scale. Typically, you know, in a, let's say a nine plex or maybe a 12 plex, you're going to be looking at a, about a 18 to a $3,000 bill for the building condition uh, assessment and inspection. They're relatively similar prices. You just have to chop around and find out what, what the best one works for you. Number two is the phase one environmental. Some investors will want to get this. Some investors don't really care. It all depends on the lender. So working with a good broker will guide you through what part of the due diligence you need to get done in order for you to understand what you have to spend money on and do. So just to give you a general assessment, an environmental is just a look at the property and the land and what it sits on and anything in and around the vicinity. So a lot of times you are looking at gas stations, we're looking at um, anything that might potentially impact uh, maybe an industrial building or you're close to uh, something that might give off some sort of envi environmental contaminants. Um, number three, again, this is something that the lenders will probably not ask for, but for us, you know, helping you guide through these transactions, there's two sets of ideas. You can go through and save a little bit of money, get the inspection done first. And if you understand and see that, you know, hey, there's some remnants of pest or bugs, maybe let's get a pest inspection on top of that. So with our phase two of due diligence, our condition is due diligence. Basically anything we need to do to investigate the building to make us feel comfortable with that transaction, we can do. So a little story uh, for pest inspections and understanding why it is super important, especially if there's evidence of bugs, is this is a bed bug. I don't know if you've ever seen one. I don't know if you've ever seen what it looks like when people are bitten, but 
if you're trying to get rid of them, it's a pain in the butt. These things are hard to kill. They move around and they can really wreak havoc on a building. And so we had one client who ended up buying a building. They had a pest problem and it cost them over $40,000 in remediation. So when you're trying to plan for these things, it's hard to understand if there's an existing bug problem and you don't know about it and you can't prove it or go back to the seller with something to say, hey, you guys have to get, take this, uh, get this taken care of prior to us moving forward. Now you just added $40,000 onto, you know, you could even call this just like, I, you could call it repairs and maintenance or a capital expenditure, something that's going to cost you money. So always, always, Make sure if you have any sort of thoughts or concerns that there's bugs there, get that pest inspection. So diving into this a little bit more, differences between residential and commercial and on the financing side. So Keaton touched on this, talking about the difference between borrower and the asset. So when you look at residential, they're going to look at your debt to coverage ratio. They're going to be looking at some of those those aspects for you as a borrower. How much do you earn? Do you have a fancy car payment? How many houses do you already own? All those things are going to look at you and say, can this person take on more debt? Even if that property is cash flowing $1,000, $1,100 a month, doesn't matter. They're going to take 50% of that rental income and still look at you as a borrower. On the commercial side, they're going to look at the building first. They're going to say, hey, is this building, is it paying for itself? Can this, can this building sustain with its rental income? Can it sustain, sustain the expenses? So they're going to look at that first. Then they're going to move over into the borrower. So when we went to go raise about a million dollars to uh, buy our apartment building, one of the things that we struggled with was there was people who said, yeah, I have a hundred grand, I have $250,000 in order to invest with you guys, but I don't wanna be on the hook. I don't wanna give a personal guarantee. And majority of lenders in the commercial game will require personal guarantees from the majority, if not all, borrowers or people that are going to be on title for this property. Even if you try to hide it in, you know, a, a corporation, they're going to make you break down that corporation and find out who is part of that corporation. And those individuals need to be on a personal guarantee. A lot of people assume that it's, you know, they're going to go after you completely, but you have to understand if there's a default on the mortgage, they're going to also be able to foreclose on the building, sell what is there, and the odds of a personal guarantee coming into effect is pretty rare. And especially if you're going in with a partnership of four people, they're going to look at everybody as a whole and not just pick apart one person with the highest net worth. Next, third-party appraisal. So this, this often gets done on the residential side. Sometimes the borrower pays for it, the purchaser. Sometimes the lender or the broker will pick up that fee. But most often in commercial, you're going to need a third-party appraisal, and that's going to be about $2,500. That is like the Kickstarter for phase two of the due diligence, because we need to make sure we can send that appraisal off to the, lend to the broker so that they can make their um, move down the chain and send their application out to the, uh, to the lenders. The other aspects that they talked about, things to understand and to know, is we also have our lender fees, broker fees. And again, if you're going the CMHC direction, there's also CMHC application fees, and there's also um, fees if you're changing anything. So we actually got caught where we had to change the corporate structure in the building that we were purchasing. And just because we were changing one name on, on the purchase contract of who was gonna be on title, that basically triggered CMHC to do a bunch of paperwork and it up, ended up costing us another $35,000, $4,000 because of that. So anytime you guys are looking at purchasing a property, make sure your, your structure and the names that you are going to have on title 
are the ones that you want to have because the last thing you want to do is get hit with another three or four thousand dollar fee that you didn't expect so understanding value james mentioned this a little bit but just to go through it once more so in order for you to understand what your house is worth a realtor is going to come by and they're going to do a competitive market analysis basically a fancy word for i'm going to look at comps and see how your house looks in comparison to everything else that's out on the market and that has sold. So they're gonna look at age, location, condition, size, finishings, all of those sort of things are gonna come and bring a, a solid picture to understand, hey, your house fits kind of right in the middle and we can probably list it at this price. Most of these houses are looking like Vancouver houses because unless you're in some of the ravine areas, you're probably not gonna be hitting that in Edmonton. But on the commercial side, uh, we talked about the income approach. And so that's the capitalization rate. And in one of my breakout rooms, um, somebody mentioned to me, they said, yeah, I wanna get into multifamily because I feel like it's, run it's like running a business. 100% correct. You know, it's exactly like running a business. A business needs to be profitable. A business needs to keep in check their revenues. They need to keep in check their expenses in order to make sure that you know, is there a point of even being in business if you're having to pay to be in that business? So really understanding the capitalization rates, understanding that business is going to really help understand how you can make that building and that property the most efficient and effective. So cap rate, we talked about it um, broke it down. So here's a little formula it gives you guys a little bit of a visual. If you guys need to take a photo of this if you want to um, get the slide decks again just message us let us know we can we can send these off no problem but to give you an example so the ratio of net operating income to building value so if you had a property that was generating two hundred thousand dollars of net operating income at a five percent cap rate the building would be value at four million dollars so that's a five percent so 5% of the building value is capitalized into income annually. So a lot of times people talk about cap rate being the yield, which essentially it is. It's the yield of what that property is going to be operating at. So let's talk about net operating income. How do we come up with that? So net operating income or NOI is basically all of our revenues. So typically in a normal building, talk about a normal multifamily building, you're going to have rent revenue and you're probably going to have laundry revenue or maybe some, some other small type of revenue that's going to be coming in. Then you're going to take all non-financing expenses, which means anything that doesn't come with um, paying for the debt, paying for the mortgage, and nothing that has to do with capital expenditures, just operating expenses. That's going to give you your net operating income. So cap rate is market dependent. So lower cap rate, cap rate translates into less risk. So a lot of times investors are like, I wanna get the highest cap rate. I wanna make sure that the yield is the best it can be. Um, but it's not always the best case scenario. You gotta find a balance. It's that risk and reward mentality. Here, this is actually a building in Strathcona. This was in 2010 when a building uh, balcony collapsed when about seven people were on top of it. So this is a great location, um, but the building obviously needs some maintenance and repairs. And then we have a building down here. This looks to be like what I call an A-class building. Newer, modern, looks pretty good. And so we would expect the building on the bottom to have a lower cap rate than the building on the top just because of the location, maintenance and repairs, and the risk associated with that building. So again, lower cap rate, cap rate translates to less risk. So typically what we see with lower cap rates is they're more desirable locations, typically a better tenant profile, building better building conditions, and less income for that purchase price. So in Edmonton, when we're looking at probably our top locations in the city, 
we're going to be looking at a four and a half to five cap on some of our less desirable locations. I'd say like middle ground, we'd be in between that five and 6% cap rate. And then if we're looking at some of the other locations, you can see cap rates in the six to sevens. So it really depends. Uh, I've even seen cap rates into the, to the high sevens and eights, but you have to really dive into your business plan and figure out what type of property you want to be owning in order to understand what type of cap rates you should be um, looking for. So how do we use the cap rate to our advantage? So assuming we have a 5% cap rate, like in that last example, anytime you increase the net operating income increases the value. So back in the day when we had uh, when Edmonton was going through these huge spikes, we would have a ton of investors who wouldn't necessarily do anything to the property. They would just increase the rent without really adding any value, but it would increase their net operating income and they would increase their building value. If they did that with enough suites, they were able to basically make the building go up in $100,000, $150,000 of value. And so some of these savvy investors, what they would do is they would refinance that, pull that, pull that extra equity out and go buy something else. And so it was, an, it was an ability to continue doing that. Now a time when you're looking at Edmonton as a very kind of steady eddy environment, we're not seeing these huge spikes of appreciation, but they're, you know, they're nice and consistent. You can still work that method into your investing strategy you just have to understand how you can use it to your advantage. So for this example, if you had a 5% cap rate, you increased the net operating income by $1,200, you'd be getting an additional $24,000 in building value. Let's make some money. All right, talk about offense. Obviously, people call this man McJesus. Didn't work this year for us, but... Um, Hopefully, fingers crossed. Next next year, we got some uh, we got some good offense, and we can finally make it past the first round. Um, but let's talk about how we can increase the offense. What can we do? So, the most ideal situation is an under rented building. Right now, currently dealing with a nine unit building. Property has been owned by the the same family for twenty two years, I believe. And the owner's kid is dealing with the building. He works three jobs. He's a professional. He's got kids. He is in the mindset of just keeping this building occupied and not pushing the rents. So it's a perfect situation for, you know, a new savvy investor, somebody who's got a business plan, somebody who wants to take that job on and in increasing the rents that are already there. And so somebody's going to come in, buy this building, figure out where that market rent is, and get them up to that market rent standard. The next is storage rooms and parking. So many people don't even think about this, but it's something that is so crucial when you're analyzing a building and you're going through a walk, going through uh, the walkabout of the building. A lot of times, back in the day, for whatever reason, people made storage rooms, man caves, they would convert old bachelor units into just like the maintenance headquarters. It has pretty much everything to be converted back. They're just not generating any income from that space. So it's a good opportunity for investors to see and be like, okay, this building is being analyzed on a maybe a 21 or 22 unit. We have an unused bachelor suite that is a maintenance room why don't we convert this back into a 22 or 23 unit building and charge market rent for a bachelor suite? Something that you can do and utilize while going through these buildings. Same thing with parking. Sometimes if you have more than one stall per suite, it gives you an opportunity to charge a little bit extra rent for those people who have one or two cars. Laundry issues. And this is always a hot topic because there's a bunch of different ways that you can set up your laundry. You can set up the laundry through a, a company, through what we call Coinomatic. They, pit, they basically take a 50% cut. They deal, they own the machines, they deal with the maintenance, they deal with 
the funding. They basically just transferred the money once a month, once they collect everything. And you know, there's no headache. But also, they're taking 50% of that income. So another way to increase your revenue is, is spend that money up front, buy and own the machines yourself, and then collect the 100% of that income every single month instead of splitting it 50-50. Sweet renovations. This is a super common, very similar to the Burr strategy, but just taking the space that you have updating it to where it needs to be and being able to um, update it to market and or better than market rent by just doing some of the cosmetic items. Typical things we see is painting cabinets, updating flooring, changing the vanity, changing some of the taps, flooring. All those things will add value to the suite. One cool tip that you can do is if you have a long-term tenant and you want to keep them in place, why don't you ask them, what do you want changed? We're going to put $200, $300 uh, of, of repairs into your suite. Is there something that you really would like to see? Or, hey, we're going to be changing the taps. Here's three options. Which one would you like to, which one would you like to have in your unit? That just builds a community within, that, within your complex and get, builds a strong relationship between you and the tenant. Now, last but not least, the Alberta Advantage. Uh, Keaton and James talked about, um, you know, why they're invested in Alberta. But one of the big things I know Ontario, I know uh, BC is is basically capped on how much they can increase rents on a, on a yearly basis. Alberta has always been called the Wild West when it comes to landlord and tenant rules. And you can basically increase the rents as much as you want. There's no cap on it. Um, depending on when your lease term is up. So if you do a ton of renovations and now you're telling your tenant, hey, we're going to double your rent, you can do that. Next, defense. Probably just as important, if not more, than your offense. I was a goalie, so I'm a little bit biased, but uh, I always find super, super important. So what are the fixed expenses? Is there any way that you can adjust these? So number one, taxes, property taxes. Most people, hey, city dictates the price, you gotta pay it, that's false. If you feel like your tax assessment is high and you're paying more taxes, you can go to the city and fight that. There's companies that you can pay in order to do that. So always take a look at your taxes, figure out if you feel they're fair. If not, go. It, it, takes like 50 or $75 in order to put an application forward. If you can get a couple hundred bucks back, it's worth your time. Insurance. Obviously, insurance is a killer. We've seen it over the last couple of years. Insurance costs have been going up. So making sure that we understand, are we getting the best deal? Shop insurance companies. Ask different brokers. That's the point of having a broker is they kind of do that work for you, and they give you the best insurance policy that's going to fit your needs. Property management fees and on-site caretaker. These are something that are um, together. You know, you can look at them depending on how you're operating your bu building. But on our building, what we recently did is we had an on-site manager forever. Seemed like she was getting a little bit lackadaisical. She was just doing the bare minimum of what needed to be done in her job description. But she was getting a heck of a deal on making sure that, uh, you know, she got uh, a, a way better discount than anybody uh, in the building. She was uh, an employee to the property management company. And we decided to go away from that, that model. And now what we're doing is we're paying a little bit higher property management fee, about 1%. And we're taking the on-site manager off of our in, uh, management structure. And now we're renting that suite out for market value rent. And then we're just having the property management company take care of those tenant showings, take care of the notices, all those work that needs to be done that from an onsite, we're just doing that. Same thing with lawn care, snow removal, all that stuff. All has been uh, handled and we're saving more money than we were before with an onsite. So different strategies for different folks. Next, expenses. So water consumption. This is probably one of the most 
overlooked item that that people typically just forget about. So low flush, low flush toilets, super important. Making sure that you get something when you're changing out a toilet, don't cheap out, figure out what's going on with it. Aerating taps and just leaky, just doing a leak audit. Um, we had, uh, I have some photos. Um, one of the contractors uh, that joins us uh, at, on Mogul Mastermind, he came to the rescue this evening. We had a giant leak at our building and I'm sure that costs us a ton of money, not, in not only in damages, but also just in that water bill. So staying on top of those leaks, um, if they're small or large, they're all gonna cost you money. So those are some big things on the water things. You can do a leak audit. You can do this while you're going through with the, uh, with the inspector, things that you really wanna look for. Natural gas, so we're kind of getting close to time, so I'm gonna speed it up a little bit, but natural gas and the things that we're gonna be looking for. So capital expenditures are something that uh, people hate doing, but adds a lot of value to the building. So those are things like windows, boiler, roof, but also when we're talking about reducing expenses, those things are like insulation, changing out your thermostat from just the old school ones to even a programmable. And now we're moving into some of those smart thermostats. So think about a, a worker who works seven days on and seven days off. If they have their thermostat cranked and they're gone for seven days, a smart thermostat can adjust and bring that temperature down to a preset amount. And when they start to see any sort of movement in the suite, they bring that temperature back up when that person's home. These things can really save a lot of costs. Expense turnover. So vacancy is probably the most expensive thing that you can deal with with the building. Now, also when you're trying to get a property leased as well. So what's your vacancy cost? How long is this property, how long is this unit going to be vacant? And how much is it gonna cost me to turn it over? So we're talking about suite upgrades. What are some of those things that you need to do? Is it typical just to paint and a touch up or is it going to be a full blown renovation? Also, what's your advertising costs? Are those covered through the property man management company or are those not? These are the things that you really wanna ask questions about when you're getting into a property management contract. Creating a game plan. All right, so analyzing market rents. So figure out where is those market rents. Now look at your pro forma. Analyze the current rents. See if they're lining up. Are they getting above the market rents on that pro forma? Look at the rent rules. Figure out where they line up in comparison to the market rents. And then that way you can decide, can I, is there any sort of increase that I can make? Or are we actually getting above what market rent is right now? And if we have a vacancy, are we gonna have to adjust that down? Analyze your current expenses. Go through everything. Is there a high plumbing bill? Is there a high electricity bill? Figure out where those costs are coming from so that you can start to reduce them. Look at every single part of the building. This is probably one of the most important things. While you're going through a property tour, most often you're only going to get through a couple of suites until you get it under contract. But while you're going through the property inspection, Get on that roof, go take a look at the boiler room, take a look at the laundry room, stick your head in every, every nook and cranny you can to get a good sense of that property. Analyze your current tenants. Find out if you're in an area that is like a C or a D area, figure out what kind of tenant profile lives in that area and what does the building currently have. Is it something that you're okay with or do you need to shift that tenant profile? How long is it going to take you to shift that tenant profile? And if you're dealing with a bunch of loud kids, but you also have um, young professionals, how is, that, how is that tenant profile going to mix? And last, make a budget. This is probably the most important thing when analyzing a property because there's fees there's expenses, there's things that always come up that you've never thought about. So really making sure you understand your miscellaneous budget is super important.
pros and cons of multifamily. I'm not going to jump into this too much, but I'm going to leave this here and then you guys can take a look at it, take a photo of it if you want. And I'll also send this out just so you guys have a, a better idea. But last but not least, when to make the jump and why. So when you're capped on the residential purchasing power, your DCR is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit tight. You don't have much more room. You want to start diversifying your portfolio. You want to leverage some and increase that net operating income. Or you have experience in other aspects of real estate investing, maybe in some other commercial avenues. This is the reason you jump from residential to commercial. Hope you guys enjoyed that presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out. And if there's anything else, let me know. I'm going to be taking a look at the comment section below and we'll go from there. Thanks so much, Adrian. Uh, I do have one question and that would be, I mean, obviously we've got a, ver a variety of, uh, of guests on tonight, some very experienced investors, some in the multifamily realm, but we also have a lot of people that want to get started. Um, they wake up tomorrow. They really want to get started. What, what, what should they be doing uh, tomorrow and Friday? What, what would somebody that wants to get into that multifamily investing realm do over the next, say, two days to, to a week? Great question. Um, so I would say you want to get yourself educated first. You want to start learning the areas, learning the locations, start understanding the lingo. You know, we're going to be tossing around cap rates, net operating income, estimated expenses, actual expenses, even being an agent, there was so many terms and things to learn. Just pick up a couple pro formas, ask, ask any of us on the team to send you some properties. We, we're, we're happy to send you some properties so, or some pro formas that you can dig through, you can read through, you can just understand what it looks like so that you can just have a conversation without everything going over your head. Perfect. And uh, something as well that uh, certainly some investors that are newer to the multifamily realm have experienced in the past that, that I'm aware of is, first off, yes, uh, it can become quite expensive to do the due diligence, and that's been well covered. Uh, but um, the process of looking at properties is a little bit different as well yeah. compared to the residential environment, sometimes where um, you don't even necessarily have access to the building. Mm -hmm. uh, until an offer is made. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, hundred percent. And great, great thing to bring up because it's a, a conversation that typically happens, uh, you know, in our first intake meetings, how does that happen? What do we do? So typically what you're going to see when you go through a showing, you're, it's hard to make a decision, um, but you have to get your head wrapped around this as well. But you can really only see the common area space, the, the mechanical room, the laundry room, and probably one or two suites. You'll probably see any vacant units and maybe one or two tenanted units, but sometimes sellers are really, really focused on not allowing anybody to spook the tenants. So sometimes uh, sellers will say, no, nope, no offers until we have, uh, or no showings until we have an offer. So those are things you really want to ask those questions about and make sure you have that comfort level ready to go. Perfect. Yeah. Cause I, I it's obviously, um, I mean, everybody has to start somewhere. Um, and, uh, yet a lot of sellers don't necessarily want their building to be the guinea pig to learn for a bunch of new investor tire kickers. So it can definitely be a challenge to get around. For sure. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's, you know, that's something that a lot of selling agents and, and owners are pretty particular with is tire kickers. And a lot of times you need to have that conversation. I've even seen some, some realtors won't work with anyone at late unless they have at least $250,000 of liquid cash or some sort of liquidity in that capital so that they can say, hey, they're ready and willing to, to look at your building and I've already verified that they have capital ready to, to move into this. So if you're asking those questions to a realtor, figure out, do they have a threshold? Have you talked to a broker? What are some of those things that they're going to be looking for in order to take you on as a client? 